the social signals of cats, some of the natural history, some problems that people routinely see when they're dealing with cats, and talking a little bit about some of the ways to handle some of those problems. Of course, each case is an individual case, so I'm not handing out panaceas that will fix things, but just a few hints here and there. Um, as I always start by saying, about 95% of what I'm going to talk about is based on hard research and data. 5% or so is of my own personal opinion, and you're free to disagree with my personal opinion as loudly as you like throughout the talk. So a review of the natural history, social behavior, and common problems seen in the domestic cat. Now the domestic cat, has, it's been debated about whether they were descended from the European wildcat, the Asiatic wildcat, or the African wildcat. And for many, many years, as you can see from these pictures, well, maybe not as well as we'd like, as you can see from these pictures, they look a lot like domestic cats. And there is a large genetic overlap. But for many years, the only way we could tell, or even guess, was to take kittens, raise them up as domestic cats, and see how they did. And the only ones that actually would tame down as kittens and act like house cats were the African wildcat. And lo and behold, when they did the cat genome project, they did find that domestic cats are descended from the Near Eastern or the African wildcat. So the, the uh, behavior did reflect the final DNA analysis. Also, we know that house cat species appeared around six to six and a half million years ago. So they've been around a much longer than we believed. Okay? They weren't necessarily living in houses at that time, but the genetics were the same. House cats were domesticated several thousand years ago, and everybody's heard the different stories about how that may have happened and whether house cats, we own house cats, or house cats own us, and all of those things. They've been selectively bred for only around the last 200 to 250 years, and quite truthfully, up until recently, they were bred for looks, they were bred for breeds, rather than for behavior or temperament. That fortunately has changed in the recent past, but mainly people were breeding to type rather than to personality, and we all know what that can do. How many of you know, for instance, that if you, meet, if you breed cats, if you breed a queen to a tom, and the tom is nasty, you have a pretty high probability of getting nasty kittens. In personality, the tom actually, personality is actually a little bit more important than the queen. And that's been demonstrated in the laboratory. It's been demonstrated in a number of ways at vet schools, etc. So if you ever want to breed, and most of us, of course, don't want you to breed, please, pick your toms carefully. Make sure they're sweet, loving, kind guys. And cats are social. They're just not like dogs in how social they are. I love this picture below because one is an Egyptian model, an Egyptian statue, and the other is a cat where you can see where they got the Egyptian statue from. Here we go. Cats are not little dogs. The social system in cats doesn't mimic human patterns. They don't have dominance hierarchies per se, and their social signals don't overlap humans very well. That's why people have trouble reading their cats and they make mistakes. And I always like to say, expect trouble from two-year-olds, and we'll talk about that later. Anybody have trouble with their two-year-old cats? You get phone calls about their two-year-old cats suddenly attacking their five-year-old cats or attacking their siblings. It's not that uncommon, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. So here's your first test. Which cat in these pictures is the dominant cat? Let's start with this one over here on your left. Which cat is dominant? The highest one, the one up high, or the one down low? How many people think the lower one? How many people think the higher one? It's actually the lower one. It's the opposite of what you would expect from dogs or from primates. With cats, the more confident the cat, the lower to the ground it will be. 
The frady cats, the nervous cats, are the ones that get up high. And actually, in Europe, they don't even use the term dominant anymore. That's completely gone out of the lingo. They now use the term confident. And the more confident cats will tend to stay down low. So in the upper right, the one looking up is the one who's the more confident. <coughs> How about in the middle here? It's, again, it's a little bit fuzzy. But which one do you think, the orange one or the gray one? How many think the orange one? How many think the gray one? It's the orange one. The orange one, they're both lying there, but the orange one has an arm dangling down. His eyes are very calm. And the gray white one, the eyes are kind of round, and he's got a little tension to him. So he's a little less confident in this situation. Location in space is a hint to social status in cats. More dominant and more confident cats stay lower. The more submissive cats like to be up high where they can see what's going on around them. A stare is a threat in any language. And if you attended my dog talk, you heard me say that as well. In most mammals, oh, all mammals in fact, and a lot of non-mammal animals, if you stare, it's a threat. In cats, for the most part, and everybody probably has a cat where this won't hold, lying on your side is not an invitation to pet your tummy. In fact, it means I'm in charge. And I've had many cats. How many of you have a cat where you're walking down the hallway and it runs in front of you and throws itself on its side? And you keep walking and it runs in front of you and throws itself on its side. And you go down to pet it and it goes Right? Not all, but some, many will. I get a lot of reports on that. That's because the cat is actually saying, oh, and this is my space. Oh, and this is my space. And oh, I'm so in charge, I can show you my most vulnerable parts and you can't do anything about it. And then the person goes and touches those parts and the cat goes, hey, that's not right. You didn't listen to me. So lying on their side. Now, there are cats who like to get their tummies rubbed, absolutely, but a lot of cats do not and will actually let you know in no uncertain terms. Dominance and submission postures use the body, the eyes, the ear, the tail, and the whiskers, which dogs cannot do. That's why I say, take that, you dogs, because they can change their whisker position. And one thing to know about cats is the social hierarchy is not a linear hierarchy. It can change with the context. So you may have a cat that's in charge of the other cats, the dominant cat, in the living room. But when it comes to feeding time, somebody else is in charge. When it comes to litter box use, somebody else is in charge. And they actually, it's very context dependent. And that holds with people as well. If the cats are treating you as part of their social environment, it will vary who's actually in charge based on what the situation and the particular context is. So let's look at some body postures. Okay. So what do these mean? I'm OK. I'm relaxed, but I'm paying attention. I'm comfortable, but why are you looking at me, right? The uh, eyes are a little bit on shape. The ears are very slightly sideways. I'm relaxed and in charge. I'm lying on my side and my head is up. And I'm so dominant, I can show my tummy and you can't do a thing about it. I'm so confident that I'm in charge in this situation. Let's look at some more body postures. I tried to pick three cats that are actually in very similar body positions. But they're saying three very different things. What is the gray cat saying? Yeah, we want to know. I was cleaning and you interrupted me. What are you going to do next? It's got that intense stare. How about the middle cat? Yes, the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. You frightened me. Please stay away. She's in a sitting posture. But her eyes are very, very round. Her ears are very upright. And her pupils are slightly dilated. And how about the third cat over there on your right? What's he saying? 
you're in my territory and I'm ticked. It's actually very forward. The eyes are very almond shaped. Look how spread the whiskers are and those ears are very alert and his brow is very intense. If you could see the whole picture, he's actually standing in a, sitting in a window, staring forward, probably at another cat in his face. The next set of slides, I have permission from the ASPCA to use their lists, and I was told you can use them as long as you tell them where you got it from. So, from the ASPCA. <coughs> if the eyes are wide open and the cat's looking at you, it's paying attention, it's listening. Half closed and relaxed, sleepy. If the pupils are slit, are slits, they say I'm alert and confident. Bug-eyed or the whites are showing, I'm frightened. Blinking, I'm comfortable with you. If you have a cat that's at all nervous, it's a really good idea to consciously blink. Just blink, because that's how cats say to each other, I'm not staring at you. Staring, stay away, I threaten. Almond shaped, I'm really angry and I'm gonna attack. Right. Now some cats are naturally more round eyed, some cats are naturally more almond shaped. So you can, you know, you can use this, but you have to base it on the cat's body and, and face as well. So now what I would like you to do is turn to the person near you and stare at them. Stare into their eyes. <laughs> I was waiting for the Pretty much everybody laughs and we get a little embarrassed when we have to stare at each other. That's because, like with cats, with primates, including humans, a stare is a challenge. So if somebody comes over and they do this, you're not going to think good things. If you've ever seen two drunk people at a bar start to challenge each other and they get bigger and bigger and they stare and stare, it's usually not a good thing. So don't stare at your cat. If you have a cat that's shy around strangers, one of the things you want to coach your, your visitors to do is not lean forward and not stare at the cat. Instead, stand upright and blink at the cat and look at the cat's nose, look at its paw, look at its tail, look at its eye. Move the sighting around a little bit and also toss some, toss some treats so the cat starts to learn good things happen to me when strangers come over. That is if it's not already hiding under the bed. If the ears are forward and relaxed, the cat is calm and alert. Slightly sideways and relaxed, the cat is resting. Slightly sideways and tense, the cat is a little bit nervous or wary. Flat and down, I'm defensive. Down and back, I'm furious, watch out. Let's look at some faces. We've seen him before. I tried to pick these in order of most intense. So look at the change in the eye shape, the change in the size of the pupil. Now granted, the cat in the upper right, it's a dark environment, so the pupils are much bigger. You have to take that into account. But you can see how the faces shift and the eyes get more almond shape as the cat becomes more irritated. Any question on these? <laughs> What'd you see? That one. I love the one the lower middle. This one? <laughs> the whiskers up there. Yeah. I mean, they're not whiskers. Oh, coming up the front, yeah. Wow. Tails tell a lot. And that's supposed to say ASPCA file, not fly, but okay. <laughs> the tail is up and relaxed. All is terrific. You've all seen, especially those of you who work with feral colonies, I'm sure you've all seen the greeting tail, which we'll see in a moment, where the tail is up high and there's a little chirp, right? The clan, it's called the family or the clan greeting. Mm -hmm. Tail is half masked, all is not terrific. Tail is dropped, I'm unhappy. Tail twitches, I'm irritated or nervous. The tail is actively twitching back off. You have the tail tip and then you have the whole tail. And you'd be surprised, or maybe not, at the number of people who think that when a tail is wagging in a cat, 
is like a tail wagging in a dog, and they don't understand why they get injured when they go to pet the wagging tail cat. So cats are not little dogs. The tail is bushy, I'm angry, and about to attack. Relaxed tails. There's the greeting tail, the erect, relaxed greeting tail. And I'm reminded when I was working for IAM's pet company, I was living in temporary housing in an apartment complex in Ohio, and there were two feral cat colonies. And they got a new manager who decided that she wanted the feral cat colonies gone because they were a health hazard, quote unquote. Well, so she hired a trapper and he put out a live trap and caught a cat. And they had older retired gentlemen on disability who would provision the feral colony. And one of the men came to me in tears and said, that trapper caught a cat, but he hasn't come back in two days, and I don't know what to do, and the poor cat is crying, and I'm afraid it's starving, and it's thirsty, and I said, well, let it out. Oh, no, I can't do that. If they catch me, they'll kick me out of the apartment. So I went and let it out, because what were they going to do to me? I was in temporary housing, <laughs> and this was a private trapper. It wasn't government. It was private trapper, and I let the cat out, and immediately the tail went up, and it started that <coughs> And all the other cats in its family came running over and chirped back, and they were doing low, little nose to nose, and then they all ran off and hid under the apartments again. So I don't know what happened to the trapper, but if I had found out who he was, I was going to call animal control on him because that was cruel. This cat tail is up, but it's a little bit tense. This cat is kind of closed in, isn't it? Kind of wrapped around itself with its tail. Nice, relaxed. What do you think of this cat? Okay. And this cat, can you see it? Puffed up, tail down. Pretty tense, pretty angry. Look at the puff on that tail. I'm sorry these pictures are not better. Wow. Yeah. So let's see what these mean. You probably already know most of them. Relaxed, the greeting, eager, wary, relaxed. This cat is not relaxed. This cat is shut down. This cat is hiding in plain sight. Okay, it looks like it's asleep, it's not. This is one of those, if I can't see you, you can't see me kind of moments. And very often I will find this in cases of new introduction, and I'll talk about an example of that in a moment. This cat is defensive, this cat is angry, this cat is threatened, so it's doing the Halloween cat, make myself look bigger and archy and hiss and growl and carry on. I had a client, because I had a private practice, as Daniel mentioned, I had a client who called me because she had five cats and was introducing another, and she said, I've got it so far, but I don't know what to do next. And I came over and I said, what do you mean by you've got it so far? Well, I've put it in a big game ca cage in the living room, and all the other cats can go up to the cage and they can meet, and it's so relaxed, it's sleeping on the perch now. So do I open the gate and let them in and let it out, or what's my next step? So I looked at the cat, and every time another cat came over, he did this and just coiled around himself. And I said, you know, ma'am, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but that cat is not accepting the other cats. That cat is hiding in plain sight. She didn't give him a cat bed or a cubby or anything to hide in. He just had no escape from being surrounded by these five cats. So fortunately, she agreed to start again, and we started with him in a separate room, let him calm down, and then we did the very gradual introduction. But you would be amazed, or maybe you wouldn't be, at the number of people who make that kind of mistake because of things like bad information on the internet, um, 
information from people who really don't know how to do cat introductions. And we often get told, even by our vet, some veterinarians, that you can do a cat introduction in two weeks. It can take anywhere from two weeks to two years to have a successful introduction. And I will show you a successful introduction a little bit later. Any questions or discussion about anything? Okay, common problems that people tell me about. I wonder how many of you have faced some of these. It eliminates outside the litter box. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. Fights with the other cats. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Scratches or bites the human. Yeah? Yeah? Accepts petting or grooming and then bites the human. That never hurts. Yeah? And the claws in the cheek. So, eliminating outside of the litter box. There are actually a lot of reasons why that can happen. And I've had some very weird cases, and I've had some very easy cases. Lots of reasons. The most common is the litter box is not clean enough. Very often, people, because we now have clumpable litter, they scoop every day or even twice a day. But when you ask them how often do you actually dump the entire box and clean it, Oh, about every three months, about every two months. If they were to stick their nose in the litter box, they would discover that it smells like a toilet. Because no matter how much you scoop, the moisture creeps down to the bottom and makes little spots that are really stinky, and the cat won't go in it. So I have to tell people, you need to clean your box completely every day. I mean, every week. And then they go, but that's going to cost me a fortune in litter. It's like, that's because you're falling for the litter company myth that you need that much litter in your box. You actually only need that much litter in your box. Scoop it out. If you need to add a little more to cover, add a little more. And then at the end of the week, dump the whole thing, scrub it out, and start again. Painful urination. What will happen is your cat will get a urinary tract infection and... It has a classical or a Pavlovian condition association with when I go to that spot that I'm supposed to pee, it hurts. So it's that spot's fault. I'm not going to go pee there anymore. Cats just know that when I have this feeling, it's painful. That location is where I have that feeling and it's painful. So that location is now associated with the pain. And they stop using the litter box. The same thing, yes, ma'am. So, so if the cat goes someplace else, mm -hmm. obviously, will it then again when it needs to go go again to a different spot? Sometimes yes. Because it be sometimes yes. Will associated with, with the, the pain? With the pain, and that's why you have cats that pee all over the house. Yeah. The problem is once it doesn't hurt anymore to pee in. It, they still don't realize that it wasn't the litter box. They still have that association. And because they never test that it doesn't happen anymore, that association stays strong. It's called escape and avoidance training. And it's very, very powerful. Um, painful defecation, you have a similar problem. The litter box comes to be associated with painful defecation. And painful defecation can happen because of constipation or because of diarrhea. When you get a cat who's got irritable bowel disease, guess what you get? Both. So the cat is never going to go into the litter box because when I really have to go, it hurts. And when I really can't go, it hurts. And it's all that litter box's fault. So there's a number of things that we do to try to repair that. Very often, we get rid of the litter box completely, and we use something like a cookie sheet that's flat with litter on it or some other substitute, and then as the cat learns that it doesn't hurt to go on the cookie sheet, it can gradually build up the sides of the cookie sheet until it's a litter box again. There's other techniques as well. Sometimes in multi-cat households, they don't like the odors of the other cats in the box. That odor is a territorial odor, after all, and they won't go in a box that another cat uses. Even if you have as many boxes as you have cats, 
very often you still run into the problem of the cat being unwilling to use the box. And one error that a lot of people make, probably not anyone in this room, but one error that people make is they may have five cats, so they have five litter boxes, and where do they put them? Side by side, right next to each other. So whereas for the human you have five boxes, for the cat you have one big box. Okay. Another thing that happens is very often in multi-cat households, a cat won't use the litter box because when it goes in the litter box, somebody attacks it. Especially with the hooded boxes, you go in, you start to come out, and somebody ambushes you from the side. Another cat goes for you. That's really scary. You're not going to go in that litter box again. I had a lady who kept her litter box in a little broom closet with a little hole cut out, and she wondered why her cat wouldn't go into the broom closet to use the litter. And we watched, and the other cats would sit on either side of the hole, and when it came out, they'd jump him. So I managed to convince her to move the litter box, or at least that, give him another that wasn't a place that he could be ambushed. Some cats develop substrate preferences. They may have pain to start with, so they pee on the carpeting, and they discover, oh, I can pee on carpeting. This is great. I'm going to pee on carpeting. Or anybody here use a plastic litter box liner? Good, because what does that teach a cat? Pee on a plastic bag. So you bring your groceries home, or you bring your dry cleaning home, and you don't get to that stuff right away. And lo and behold, when you do, there's pee all over it. Or Anybody line their litter boxes with newspaper? Same problem. And cats develop a preference for what they're going to use, and sometimes it's not the preference that we want. And then finally, of course, you have territorial spraying. Cats will spray vertically, but they also will spray horizontally. I don't know how many people know that, but cats will do a territorial spray squatting as well as standing. There's different solutions for each problem, and sometimes you have to do a combination. Fighting with other cats. Again, multiple reasons. There may be a medical one. Your cat may have a thyroid disease or may have um, undiagnosed pain. They have finally come to recognize over the past five years that older cats do get arthritis in their joints. And just like all of us who get arthritis in our joints, well, that can make us a little bit grumpy because we're in pain all the time. Um, oh, those two-year-old cats. In feral colonies, they have discovered that two-year-old cats, especially the males but sometimes the females, leave the natal colony at about that time. When they reach around two years old, the guys get kicked out because the queens don't want to mate with their own sons. And the guys have to leave. Sometimes the females will leave if there's not enough natural resources for everybody to stay. If it's a well-provisioned colony, if there's a lot of mice and a lot of frogs and a lot of food and water and shelter, the girls will stay with their moms and be with the colony. If there's not, very often the girls will get kicked out or sometimes the mothers will leave that colony to the, the two-year-old girls and go form their own colony a little bit distance away. So there's some variations. But what happens in a multi-cat household, especially in places like Collier County where your cats have to stay indoors, the two-year-olds are ready to disperse, the older ones are ready for them to disperse, and they can't leave. So. The two-year-olds have this innate need to start carving out a territory and a colony environment. And the only way to do that is to chase the other cats, fight with the other cats, do those kinds of things. So very often, I will get calls for clients who say, I've got a brother and sister, and they're just about two years old, and they're fighting. 
or I've got a two-year-old and a five-year-old who have been together the two-year-old's whole life, and suddenly the two-year-old is attacking the five-year-old. And it's like, yeah, because your two-year-old's a grown-up now, and it's trying to make its way in the colony that it cannot leave. So we see that quite a lot. Very often you'll get fighting because there's too rapid an introduction, and we already talked about that. It's not a two-week process. It can be a two-year process. Um, and then finally you get redirected aggression if you have neighbor cats or stray cats who come around and stare in your windows or scent mark urinate on your house and your property. Your cats may see that cat or smell that cat through the window, get all agitated and aroused. So here's Josie going, I'm going to get him, I'm going to get him. And here's Smitty all instant going, oh, what's going on? And Josie sees him and goes, BAM! Because that's all he can get. Redirected aggression, aiming it at something that's moving, that's not the thing that you really want. And then poor Smitty freaks out, is terrified, and then you get into this whole big cycle of attack and retreat and attack and retreat, and you have to retrain them to love each other again. It can be done. Again, different solutions for each cause. You want to slow down the introductions. If you see that one cat is tending to attack the other cat, you can look for early signs. Like if I'm getting ready to attack you, one of the things I may do is just stare at you. I'm not doing anything, I'm just staring at you. And then I don't have a tail, but my tail starts to flip a little bit. I would pick up that cat and give it a time out. Just for 10 minutes, you don't have to yell at it, don't have to spray it, just scoop it up. Take it to another room, let it calm down again. It's all you have to do. But you have to do it as soon as you notice there's going to be a little bit of a problem before the problem happens. Because if you stick your hand in there when the fight is actively going on, that's probably not a good thing to do. <laughs> Try to block the view of outside cats. Close your curtains, add cardboard. I mean, it doesn't look great, but what you want to do is not get that redirected aggression. They do s s sell air sprayers that are motion sensors that you can put on your property areas that will hiss and spray air at the cats that are coming around to chase them off. They work moderately well depending on the cat, um, but they do help. And then finally, if your cat is fighting with another cat, don't assume that the one that's attacking is the one that started it. It may be the one that finished it. It may be the other cat that's doing the staring, agitating the attacker to the point where it can't stand it anymore and it goes and attacks that other cat. It happens fairly regularly, so you've got to actually look at both cats in the situation to see who actually needs the time out. Because it may not be the attacker, it may be the instigator. All little innocent with the little halo in place. I didn't do anything. Cleo and Zoe. Cleo is on your left and she's licking Zoe. Very nice couple had Cleo. Cleo is eight years old, Siamese, very nice cat. And they were traveling a lot and they decided that Cleo was lonely. Cleo had been an only cat from the time they got her at six weeks. So they got Zoe at 10 weeks to keep Cleo company. Yeah, you can pretty well guess what the upshot of that situation was. Zoe constantly jumped on Cleo. Cleo constantly hid, hissed, growled, ran, hid under the bed. And the owners were fit to be tied. They didn't know what to do. So I said, OK, let's slow things down. Zoe can be with Cleo no more than an hour at a time. And then she has to be separated. I don't, you guys can give them both attention separately. If Zoe attacks or starts to chase Cleo, Zoe gets a timeout. And when Zoe is around, I want you to give Cleo treats and I want you to play with them both separately with favorite action toys so that they're playing in the same room but not together. And they did what I asked. And six months later, this was the picture they sent me. It took six months, and Cleo accepted Zoe. Zoe stopped being so obnoxious to Cleo, 
and they would sit and groom each other on the owner's lap. It was wonderful. It was just an introduction that went too fast. So there's two messages to that particular story. One is, don't rush the introduction. And the other is, please don't get a cat for your cat. Get a cat because you want another cat. <laughs> or if your cat used to have another cat and seems lonely, see what cats it's going to get along with. But don't assume that because your cat's eight years old and it's been by itself the whole time that suddenly it needs a companion. <laughs> Cleo would have been perfectly content never to have Zoe in her life. Scratches or bites the human. Multiple reasons again. Thyroid disease, I diagnose pain, feline hyperesthesia. That's that extra super sensitivity that some cats develop. All you have to do is brush their back and their whole skin ripples and they go nuts. It's, like, it's almost like fibromyalgia, but it's not the same thing. Fear. Anger, meaning dominance or territorial, um, and the body language is different, and the treatments are different. The, the behavior plans that you use are different. Medical, do as your veterinarian prescribes. Sometimes you also have to do behavior modification because they've learned the habit of that behavior. It's not just the medicine now that's caught the, the medical condition that's causing it. They have to learn to do something else instead of that habit. Fear signals, blink, turn your back, move back, stop being accidentally threatening, and try to redirect. You'll see in all of our cages we have a little wire with a little bit of cardboard at the bottom. It's called a cat dancer. Cats just absolutely love them. I've never seen a cat not want to play with a cat dancer. Have a cat dancer with you and Get the cat to be less aggressive by having it play. If it's fear, you're not rewarding it with the play. You're changing its mind about what the context of the situation is. And then the aggression, blink again so you're non-threatening. But again, you want to watch for those early signals, those flattening ears, the almond-shaped eyes, the tail starting to flick, and give that cat a timeout. Carefully, you don't want to get killed, but give that cat a timeout before it gets to the point where it attacks you. What you want to also pay attention to is what is the trigger for the aggression? Cats will redirect to you as well. Um, I had a case, this woman had three cats. I never could figure out what the situation was. She'd had the cats since they were kittens. And when they were adults, like five and six and eight years old, she brought in a Yorkshire Terrier puppy. And the three cats went absolutely ballistic and tried to kill the puppy. I mean, really? To the point where she scooped it up and held it above her head to get it away. And they climbed her like a tree to get to the puppy. She had wounds so severe from scratches and bites, she ended up in the ER. And she showed me pictures. It was horrific. It looked like a tiger had tried to shred her. This poor puppy and this poor woman and these cats just absolutely went nuts over this puppy. It was very strange. So you want to work with treat training and slow introduction of, to whatever it is it's attacking to reduce the attack to reduce the sensitivity to the object. Accepts petting or grooming and then bites you. Anybody have a cat like that? Ah, in the back of the room. Make your sessions shorter. Figure out how much the cat can tolerate and then stop. The cat is sending you signals that it's had enough. It may be sitting on your lap and had enough. It's not going to jump down. It's a cat. It will send you signals. Are the ears sideways? Is the tail starting to twitch? Are the whiskers flattening? Pay attention to those signals. Put the cat down. Now, I don't mean kill the cat. I mean set the cat down. <laughs> or if it's too dangerous, and I've had cases where it was too dangerous for the owner to pick up the cat, because if you touch the cat on the belly, it would attack. Stand up. The cat's on your lap. Just stand up or take a pillow and push the cat off. You don't have to use your arms. 
This is not about dominance. People think, like with dogs, we get told the dog can't win or we get told the cat can't win. It's actually not about dominance. It's about how much stimulation the animal is able to tolerate. Have you ever been really tired? You had a long day, maybe you're sweaty, you're achy, all you want to do is chill out, and your partner starts stroking your arm? Okay. There's only so much of that you can tolerate. Right? We've all been there. And you just want to go, leave me alone! Well, the cat is trying to say, leave me alone. And just like your partner, if they don't get the subtle signals, you have to escalate your communication until they get the signal, the communication. And for a cat, that may be biting or scratching. So when you recognize the signal and you stop the petting, you allow the cow to reduce its arousal and you are not escalating the situation. What you will discover is when you do respond appropriately to the signal, later petting sessions, later grooming sessions, will actually go longer because the cat is more relaxed and more able to deal with and to tolerate and not get so aroused by the stimulation. If the cat starts to get too agitated or attacks you, again, time out for five to 10 minutes. Put it in another room. And quite truthfully, Fresco was in charge of the house and the man had become engaged recently, and Fresco was beating the you-know-what out of his fiance. Okay. If she sat on a chair, or if she sat on the couch next to this man, Fresco attacked her. If she slept in the bed with this man, Fresco attacked her. If they locked Fresco out of the bedroom, he would beat on the bedroom door and meow so loudly that they got no sleep and he would go on for hours. The Fresco would jump on the man's lap when the man was sitting in the living room and the man would pet Fresco until Fresco had enough and then instead of jumping down, Fresco would bite him. And it was just all of this, all of this, all of this. And I watched Fresco and this man and this really was a case where the cat believed he was in charge. He owned the man and he didn't want the woman. So he was in charge. So I coached the man to not let the cat jump in his lap when the cat wanted to. He was to take a pillow and push the cat off and then say to the cat, okay, you can come up now. And the cat would jump up and then he would pet the cat, but he was only allowed to pet the cat for three minutes. And then he was either to take the pillow and shove the cat off or stand up. And he called me up hysterically laughing because the first time he did this, when he stood up, Fresco came up to him and went and just told the man off in cat. We don't know what he said. We don't know what bad words he used, but he just was completely vocal and clearly very upset that this, this man had taken charge. And we started to use timeouts with Fresco. If he started to get a little twitchy, if his tail would flip, if his ears flattened, timeout. And he did pretty well. He was never going to be the perfect cat. But he did learn to tolerate the fiance, and he did learn not to bite, and that he didn't get to pick when he got petted. They allowed him to be petted and had a little more control over the situation. So I keep saying time out, time out, time out. What's a time out? Yeah, it is a pretty cute little kitty with the tongue sticking out. Timeouts serve two purposes, and this was debated for a while among the behaviorists. I attend a conference every year of 30 behaviorists, and I introduced the concept of the timeout in cats because I was using it with my clients, and the purpose of this conference was to share tricks of the trade. And the debate was, does the timeout punish the cat for the inappropriate behavior, or does the timeout allow the cat to calm down and be less aroused so that it can chill out and be calm again? And the answer is it does a little bit of both. It's not truly punishing. It's not like spanking the cat or spraying the cat with water. Instead, what you're doing is removing the social reward. Think of it this way. All of us, I'm guessing, I can't speak for you, have probably been angry enough 
that you reached a point where you had to yell at somebody. Okay, now in New York, we're yellers. I'm from New York. Nobody thinks anything of it. But I've lived in the Midwest for 20 odd years. And when somebody reaches the point where they actually yell at you, they are really beyond upset. And what you find is when the person reaches that point, much as it embarrasses them and it makes them feel uncomfortable, it also feels good because they've gotten all that tension out. So yelling is rewarding. It's, a social, it's socially rewarding because you've got rid of all that stuff that you've been carrying around. Well, it's kind of similar for cats. Getting to do that aggressive behavior is rewarding because the other person squeaks or the cat, the cat runs away. And it just has a lot of positive consequences to the animal doing the attacking. When you give it a time out, before it gets to that attack point, or even after it gets to the attack point, you're eliminating that social reward. It's not getting that finale. It's not getting to turn that last page in the detective novel to find out who done it. It's getting that removed. So what it says to the cat is, when I start to feel like this, I lose everything I wanted. Darn. Okay. So it's a type of punishment, but it's not aversive. The other thing it does is it lets the cat calm down. You take it out of the context that's getting it so aroused and upset and letting the cat go, oh, chill. Now the thing is, the timeout is not sticking in a crate. The timeout is not it can't have any toys or food. The timeout is go into a separate room with the door closed for five to ten minutes until you're calmed down, until you're disaroused and then you can come back out again. It allows a change of context in the environment and to the cat so that it can focus on something else. Um, there are times when you give your cat a 10 minute time out and it comes back out and it goes right back toward to attack again because it's not de-aroused yet gets another time out for two reasons. One, you don't want it to get the social reward to get by attacking. And two, you want it to calm down. So even if it's only been out for 30 seconds, if it starts to do that whole attack sequence again, right back in it goes for another five to 10 minutes. Now I do have to tell you about Sally. <laughs> because there's no perfect program. Sally was a cat. She was about six years old. And she had been owned by this woman's brother, the woman who called me. And unfortunately, her brother committed suicide, and she had agreed to take Sally. Well, this woman was a cat rescuer, and she had some fosters, and she had some permanent rescue cats in her house. And Sally continually attacked the cats. There were seven cats and Sally. So, we started in with the keep an eye on Sally, and when she's getting agitated, give her a time out. You know what Sally learned? First I attack, and then I go into this other room. So she would attack, and then she'd walk herself into her time out room and wait for the door to close. Yeah, smart cookie, you know. Sometimes they learn what you but they learn not what you're telling them, not what you're teaching them. So we increased it to 15 minutes. It didn't make a difference. She would just, she got more pleasure out of the attack than she got <laughs> negative out of the timeout. So the woman just built her, her sole whole separate alcove with a porch, because it was in Georgia, so it was nice weather most of the time. And she just kind of lived her solitary life without dealing with the other cats and everybody was happy. Like I said, there's no such thing as a perfect plan. It works most of the time, but not always. So let's finish up a little bit with some myths and some realities. The myth is that cats are not trainable. Have any of you gone to a Renaissance fair where the cat guy's there with his eight cats all doing their little tricks? Or, you know, maybe you've seen a circus show. Cats are very, very trainable, and they respond to reward, punishment, and timeout. And yes, there is a movement in the country for feline agility. And they do pretty well. They use a cat dancer, and they teach the cats, and then they fade the cat dancer. And it's very much like watching dog agility. The cats go running through it. They have a great time. 
The owners tend to trip a little bit, but that's okay. That's like dog agility as well. The myth is that cats are not social. In fact, they have cat buddies, they have family groups. All of you people already know that, and very often we're included in the family group. Um, there's another myth I forgot to put on here, which is that cats don't like swimming or don't like water. In fact, cats love to fish, and you may see them in our cat rooms. They don't use them as much as they might, but we have big plastic tubs of water, and we float toys in there, and cats will actually go stand in the water to fish. So there are a, quite a few domestic cats that actually like water and will swim and will fish. They won't necessarily <laughs> want to take a bath, but they do like it on their own terms. Cats ignore humans and are independent. In fact, cats usually do want to interact. Sometimes they want to dominate, like Fresco. And some cats are more sociable than others. It's all individual differences, individual personalities, just like with people. So thanks. What questions do you have, or what would you like to talk about? That's my Hamish boy, by the way. Yes? Um, how can you tell the difference between like, playing and fighting? Because sometimes my cats, they, kind of, they, they growl at each other a little bit, but they seem to be playing like no one's actually being um, you have to kind of base it on, on whether it escalates or not. If they start, because they will growl a little bit, and that's not ideal. But if they stay together rather than really getting nasty, are the claws in or out? Can you tell? You know, like, it seems like it's playing with them sometimes. It's like, I just, like, like, it's never, like, really bad. Like, no one ever comes out with, like, a scar or stab. Yeah, so. yeah, they may get, they may, see, play can escalate into aggression. And kind of, if they're not hurting each other, you may not want to worry about it too much. But what you can do is distract them with something before it reaches that point, just so that they don't get to a point where they get a distrusting of each other. Yeah. Yeah. Why do certain cats hiss? And then it is not fear. I don't think it's fear. It's, is it just like a natural thing? I when, mean, when are they hissing, though? What's the circumstance? It's like when you walk in the room. <laughs> No, you might have startled them a little bit. I mean, it is it is a fear response, but it may have just been well, a startle. It like certain cats will just hiss. Right, yeah. And others won't. Yeah, uh, it, again, individual personalities. Did you know that they've discovered, speaking of cat vocalizations, that a purr is not always a happy cat? Purrs, cats will purr when they're anxious. It's kind of a self-soothing behavior, so if your cat's purring, it doesn't always mean that they're just in love and enjoy and everything. Sometimes it means that they're a little bit worried. They, they purr too before they die. Oh, it's okay. It's really bizarre. Yeah, okay, I didn't know that. I do know that some cats will purr in the vet's office. Oh, I'm nervous, it's okay. <laughs> I'm nervous, it's okay. I'm nervous, it's okay. Who else? Yes, Daniel. You said uh, not to stick your hand in between two cats fighting for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. If two cats are really going at each other, what do you do? There's a number of things. One is to make a loud noise, startle them out of it. Another thing you can do is throw a blanket over them. That will startle them out of it. Um, when in doubt, you can get a water bottle and spray, and sometimes that will stop them. Okay, so mainly what you want to do is startle them so that they separate. But you're in, you're at risk of getting seriously injured if you stick a hand in there, yeah. Because they will they will not know that it's you. They just know it's another living thing getting into their fight, and they'll think that it's joining the fight rather than separating them. How about this? I had a uh, a cat that every night she was one girl. She was a girl of two other boys in the house, and about every night at the same time when we go to bed, she'd get on top of the entertainment center and perch there and let out this really low guttural howl almost. And it's like clockwork every night. Is, is yeah. that indicative of some sort of? Um, there's a couple of things it can be. One is that's a clan call. She's trying to call the clan. The other is it can be a hunting call if she wanted to hunt, but she couldn't. Um, I've known a cat make that noise where 
for some reason, her name was Mom, and for some reason she thought that if she caught a lizard, she had to share it with the rest of the family, which was us, and she would bring the lizard home and go, and we'd all come running, and she'd drop us the lizard and expect us to eat it. So, you know, it's a possibilities. You know, that we don't know for sure because she's not telling us, but those are some possibles for that particular type of sound. Who else? Anybody else? Yes? Is there any good way to deal with, like, veterinary, like, going to the vet, like, aggression in, um, like, society without having to drug them? Um, yeah, actually, if you go, there's a website by a veterinarian called Sophia Yin. Y I N, and she actually has some good ways of getting your cat used to going to the veterinarian. And one of the things you can do is practice the things at home. I mean, you're not going to stab it with anything like a needle, but you can practice the little pinch poke. You can practice getting its ears looked at and those other things. And then um, if you look at her, her um, internet site, she talks about how you can wrap a cat safely in a towel and keep it calm while you're doing it. It's almost like swaddling a baby. So yeah, there are some techniques and a lot of it is just desensitizing the cat to what's going to go on in the vet's office. Well, because my cat's fine with all of that. It's like the second that you walk in the office, all of a sudden he lets out a low, like the, like the really low hiss growl. Yeah, because he's scared. There's a lot of strange odors, odd animal odors in there, and it's a scary place. Yeah, so the vet is probably doing something that helps the body. Well, that I'm too. Just, yeah. Right, like taking yeah. blood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. a yeah, a lot of it is training the cat to be comfortable there, and it, oh, yeah. it takes some work, but it can be done. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? One yes. more for me, sorry. Uh, in the beginning, you talked about how cats would dilate their eyes to a certain diameter, meaning as a communication, I guess. Uh -huh. Are they the only animals that do that, and do they, do they control it? Are, are they aware that they're doing it? It's, um, it's, physio thing? it's physiological. It's, it's no more different than what we do. If we're nervous or scared, our eyes get real wide. If we're angry, we tend to tense everything, and we're not actively aware of it. Actors become actively aware of it because they have, they have to substitute those signals in. Um, but yes, there are lots of animals that change the eye shape, um, change the tension. Dogs do it, primates do it, um, horses can do it, dolphins give you stink eye if they're ticked off at you, captive dolphins. So is so, it dilating because the it's eyes not the, are closing and it's not less the, lights getting in? Um, we're not sure. Um, because, again, it's physiologically, you're talking about the pupil of the eye? Correct. Okay. That's physiologically based. If, like, if someone is in love with you, their pupils dilate. It's just part of the physiological arousal. So as their, their physiological state changes, the shape of the pupil will change as well. Huh. It's part of what the body does. That's interesting. I always thought it was just simply letting in light into your eye, and that was the only factor. That's part of it, probably, but no, it's actually a real change. Um, they always used to joke about actresses in movies who had to look like they were in love. They used to use drops to dilate their pupils so they would be more realistic. Do you think animals can actually be in love with their owner? Uh, I think animals can be very affectionate. I mean, in love, we are we talking about, excuse the expression, humping dogs? Or? No. <laughs> I, I don't know. Sometimes, well, my, my dog, she looks at me like she's in love with well, me. Well, like, uh, they, they, yeah, I mean, they love us. I wouldn't, you know, we could analyze it scientifically and call it a physiological state and measure the hormone levels and all of that. But yeah, our animals love us, absolutely. I think so. And we love them too. We love them too. Yeah. They act all happy to see us and snuggle up and all of those things. That's why we have them. Yeah. <laughs> they make us feel good. Anyone else? Anyone have something I said that they disagree with? I just have one thing. Yeah. I think that was a fabulous presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It was very good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, the hour flew by. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We have some refreshments outside in the lobby there. And um, I appreciate
appreciate you coming. Thanks very much.